beasts all over the shop. You'll be one of them sooner or later. Are you going hollow waiting for Elden Ring? If so, you've come to the right place as we rank some of the best bosses ever crafted by From Software. I am Ghost Repost and the host of this countdown, which will be a comprehensive series starting with Bloodborne and running through Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, Demon Souls, and yes, even Sekiro. While an overdone topic, this is something I've always wanted to do and it's a perfect place for me to try out a fully produced video. The idea behind this series is as much to entertain you guys as it is for me to learn how to more precisely study game and boss mechanics. All the rankings in this series are 100% factual, undebatable, and tested by science. Joking aside, I wanted to have some kind of method behind my rankings rather than just saying this boss is better than that boss just because I liked it more. While it's not a factual endeavor and subjectivity has to kick in somewhere, I wanted to at least put a structure behind what I am doing. I decided to go with five categories. Boss aesthetic or art direction, soundtrack, arena design, story or lore implications, and lastly, the actual gameplay and boss mechanics themselves. I ranked the bosses within these five categories. Being 22 bosses in Bloodborne, the first ranking would receive 22 points, and the last one point for all five categories. Five totals were then added up to determine the overall order. I thought about adding weights to each category, but thought I could ask for subscriber input on the system before getting too deep into the woods. While I'm sure many holes can be poked in the system, I think it's solid for a first attempt. The Excel sheet with all scores is in the description. With that aside, let's begin counting down the bosses of this masterpiece. Bloodborne is full of excellence, but it does have a few doozies. We start off at number 22 with the Witch of Hemwick. The bottom of the barrel had to be someone and has got to be the Witch of Hemwick. Fun fact, in my first ever playthrough of Bloodborne, I thought this mad one was the Witch and it decimated me almost instantly. Quite embarrassing. Once you know what you're doing though, this fight is quite trivial. You'll basically run in circles until you can backstab and fist the actual boss, at which point a second Witch will appear. It turns out, the Mad Ones are completely avoidable and basically just aimlessly wander. Be quick to take out the second witch or she'll respawn the first. Even if that happens, you still run in circles until you've taken them out. If she catches you in her magic, the Mad Ones can gank you and you'll have to make the Walk of Shame back in embarrassment to get back to her. At least she guards the Rune Workshop tool, so at least there's that. I once thought the One Reborn was literally the boss of the game. For a first time player, the incredibly tough run up through Yahar Ghoul, the gruesome yet awe inspiring cutscene of a creature falling out of a blood moon and Bell Maiden shooting at you from every direction certainly seems like endgame stuff. If I had played Demon Souls, I would have realized in the fashion of the Tower Knight, there was probably a staircase simply leading up to the Bell Maidens, which of course there is. Once you begin actually dueling with the one reborn, you realize he's pretty much stationary and flails around like a complete scrub. Every now and again, He'll piss out a pool of poison, he'll drop some skeleton bodies, or shoot out some half-assed spells. But either way, just swing away and you'll take care of the one reborn in no time. The best thing about the living failures is they are the only thing standing between you and one of the most beloved bosses in the entire Soulsborne series. But this boss rests on the other end of that dichotomy. Not particularly a gank boss as it treads so slowly it doesn't matter that they outnumber you 4 to 1. Parries and backstabs are the key to this one, as you, again, basically run in circles to isolate one unless you possess the skill to fight multiple at once. They do sport what is pretty cool arena leading up to the Astral Clock Tower, have a solid soundtrack, and they do hold some decent lore as perhaps the living failures were early attempts of the Healing Church trying to create the Celestial Emissary. Either way, these living failures are aptly named as it can easily be chipped away at until victory, not a boss for the history books. Ah, cos. Or some say cos. At least Mikolash has deep lore implications, but this has got to be one of the most irritating bosses in the entire Soulsborne series. His arena and soundtrack very much suit him, but that doesn't make this a fun boss to play unless you enjoy chasing a crazed maniac around a maze of foggy staircases, dodging through skeletons who do a shocking amount of damage, and like being taunted by a grown man who sounds like he's yet to hit puberty. 
Once you finally corner him, you begin taking him to town, bypassing his one attack, only to find there's a part two, in which you have to repeat part one. Only he can now one-shot you with a call beyond and an infinite supply of Quicksilver bullets. The element of figuring out how to corner him into his arena feels less puzzle-like and more of an annoyance, and once you actually beat him, it feels less like an accomplishment and more like you can actually move on with the game. The Blood Starved Beast is aesthetically horrid to look at in every way. I mean, look at the guy. This is brutal. A friend of mine even refers to him as skin flaps, and for good reason. Although, he does fit the aesthetic of Old Yarnum perfectly. I like the idea of a boss being a souped up version of the enemies throughout the level. While maybe not the most memorable track in Bloodborne, the music does an excellent job of building and keeping tension throughout. The arena itself provides useful to new players as you can use the columns for a small reprieve and even play Ring Around the Rosie around the altar in the back of the arena. The actual combat revolves around either parrying the beast on a loop or using a combination of fire-related melee and projectile attacks, along with the odd pungent blood cocktail. Not the most groundbreaking fight, but definitely a nice test at this point in the game as the actual size of the beasts begins to ramp up. Dark Beast Parl lays as a pile of bones to be stumbled upon from either Hyposian Jail or later on through the Unseen Village. Full of electricity, but extremely weak to arcane and somewhat to fire, Dark Beast Parl can be difficult until you walk off and focus on his legs, at which point he will crumble back down. Almost more of a puzzle in this regard, as locking onto his head makes the camera tracking pretty unreliable. While not a bad track, the music isn't one of From Software's most memorable. Aesthetically, it's hard to deny Dark Beast Parl looks badass, but it's hard to not feel as if, though, he was just included just to have another boss in the game. According to fandom, he was solely designed by Miyazaki, but it's hard to rank him anywhere but the middle of the pack. Amygdala, Amygdala. With reference to this beast throughout the game, and even its appearance in various forms, she should be recognizable upon entrance to a telegraphed arena that is perhaps not the most inspiring, but probably is meant to be quite dull in appearance, as this is the nightmare frontier after all. Amygdala prizes a unique puzzle as the good old flank and R1 spam isn't likely to work well due to our legs and tail being quite sturdy. If you want a good laugh, run a pure arcane build and spam executioner's gloves. She will basically melt in under 10 seconds. Melee builds are better off keeping a safe distance and dodging her swipes and lasers to do big damage to her head when it drops. Big repost damage is likely due to her head being her weak spot and she will present this opportunity once or twice if damage accumulates to her skull. An excellent soundtrack like most in the game, you most likely won't remember it without looking it up. Amygdala are classified as great ones, and statues of them appear throughout the game. Ranking higher than one might expect, this is due to Celestial Emissary having pretty relevant lore and a unique arena. Resulting from experimentation by the Healing Church, the Celestial Emissary, while not the most intricate or challenging boss in the world, can actually be quite fun. I love the way you just stumble into a random garden that you would not necessarily think is a boss, and a boss bar appears. Even at that point, you still look around, confused, like what on earth is happening right now, as ten or so goofy aliens barge towards you. Eventually, you'll notice the one in the back is our man. He can either have fun with the tiny... Tonitris? Nailed the pronunciation. Probably not. Any heavy arcane investment will basically decimate everything here. Any sort of crowd control melee weapon should do. Part 2 sees our friend ascend into Gigantor with lasers, at which point it's almost even easier as we run in and crush him. While Mergo's Wet Nurse is pretty low on the difficulty curve for being an endgame boss, there's something intriguing about its formless design and the beautiful mix of purple and black. A departure from the grand orchestral arrangements of other boss tracks, the hauntingly beautiful lullaby that plays behind this decrepit arena fits just right. Mergo's moveset is heavily telegraphed and slow, other than one cycle, perhaps representative of an actual nightmare where she disappears and clones of herself can occur but a bit of running and dodging should be enough to wait her out. Mergo's wet nurse serves as somewhat of a surrogate mother to Mergo, actual baby of Yarnum, the Tumerian queen. 
She is one of only three bosses to display Nightmare Slain upon defeat. Not the best boss, but not the worst. Mergo fits neatly into the middle of the pack. The Shadow of Yarnum is often cited as a wall for first time players, and it certainly was for myself. If you're not used to being ganked, this fight will take quite a while to get used to. Without summons, it can be very difficult for new players to keep track of three opponents. The Shadows are not the most lore relevant boss, but the Blood Rapture rune states they are servants of Yarnum, the Tumerian Queen. In my opinion, Shadows are one of the more underrated bosses in the game, as they present a unique challenge with a big enough space and a massive headstone that can be used to block off one or two of the Shadows at a time. This combined with their badass faceless black robes and mixed movesets ranging from a flaming katana to a version of the Madeira's whistle, snake summoning, give the Shadows a challenging but fun design. Not the most memorable soundtrack, but even less memorable soundtracks in Bloodborne tend to suit the boss or atmosphere at the very least, and this one fits that bill. Moon Presence often feels more like a victory lap boss than anything, and the hardest part will probably be your depleted resources from fighting Garmin. If he takes you out, you will most likely smack him around once fully replenished. If you've made it this far, Moon Presence really doesn't present anything more difficult than you faced so far. He has an attack that leaves you with 1 HP, but his cooldown is so long that you should have plenty of time to rally your health back should you have good distance management. The soundtrack, while well produced like others in the game, isn't one you'll probably listen to time and again. Being a great one, the Moon Presence was originally summoned by Lawrence, as referenced by a note in the second floor of the lecture building. Again, referenced by a second floor lecture hall note, the Moon Presence may be trying to hunt great ones, and uses the hunter's dream as a way to carry out his goals. Astute players will notice Vicar Amelia actually shares a soundtrack with the Cleric Beast, perhaps as they are both members of the Healing Church. This fight takes place in the Grand Cathedral and as one of the more terrifying scenes in the game as Amelia transforms into a giant beast and presents one of the cooler designs on the beast front in the game, holding her medallion tight to her chest as well as sporting her grey eye coverings. Amelia's pendant notes, this pendant passed down among the Vicars, who head the healing church, is a reminder of the cautionary adage. To reveal the adage, touch the altar skull. More on that later. Fight-wise, Amelia is one of the few bosses who can replenish health, which is countered by the use of Numbing Mist. Amelia presents a pretty standard beast puzzle of timing, her swipes with dodges to flank her from the side or back. The one difference is her ground pound attacks, which shoots out a black dust-like cloud. Once beating this beast, one of the most memorable scenes in Bloodborne can be played, as noted by interacting with the altar. We are born of the blood, made men by the blood, undone by the blood. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. As Matthew Matosis once famously said, if you can't make it good, make it difficult by adding more stuff. I have to agree with him on this one. Rom, however, does have some redeeming qualities. This fight is very challenging for new players, having to avoid Rom's minions and arcane spells at the same time. I'm generally not a fan of boss minions that are more of an annoyance than anything and add no real value to the actual fight itself. Dodging the arcane spells isn't particularly interesting, although it does at least teach you to master the claw grip on the controller. Once you get in on ROM, you basically just hack away with free shots. One redeeming factor to this fight is the deep lore in the spider who Master Willem beckoned to be the spider who guards all rituals. ROM is a turning point from mostly beasts to celestial beings. Lore aside, the fight is more of a chore than anything. Cleric Beast tends to produce a wide variety of opinions, from him being a flat out wall and the reason players quit the game, to people being stunned at how easy he is. I'm not entirely sure what accounts for this, other than prior gaming experiences or just general gameplay ability, but Cleric Beast is for certain one of the more memorable bosses in Bloodborne, mostly due to him being the first boss most players will encounter, to his spectacular entrance, and of course his stunning soundtrack. Bloodborne bosses tend to be either more humanoid or beast-like, 
and Cleric Beast is a solid introduction to the monster boss type that appear throughout the game. The Cleric Beast arena is quite unique as a grand battle on the high bridge is awesome in theory, but in practice you'll find yourself fighting the camera and tight spaces a little more than maybe necessary. Once you learn the spacing, timing, and almighty strategy of smacking that booty, Cleric Beast will become a boss you'll generally best on the first try in subsequent runs. A solid introduction to boss encounters in Bloodborne. Lawrence presents a lot of familiarity, hosting the same arena as Vicar Amelia, as well as having the same design as the Cleric Beast, plus fire. Even being a reskin, Lawrence presents quite the imposing figure and a devastating moveset. Certainly one of the most difficult bosses in the game due to the sheer damage he could output with his three swipe attack likely to send you back to the land. Lawrence presents more than a formidable way to close out one of the best DLCs in gaming if you left him for after Orphan a Cause. He fights you amidst a beautifully memorable soundtrack which perfectly captures a grand church choir which suits Lawrence's founding and downfall of the healing church. Having betrayed Master Willem at Bergenworth, Lawrence succumbed to the ministration of blood causing his downfall and transformation. While maybe not the most unique beasts, having faced a version once already, the grand scale of him in the cathedral along with the feeling of accomplishment when conquering him surely puts him amongst the best creations in the game. If you like fighting man-child infants, wielding placenta as a weapon on an eerie beach backdrop, this is the boss for you. Orphan of Cause is quite the departure from most Bloodborne bosses. Highly erratic, kinda humanoid, but with a strange frenetic moveset, this is quite the unique challenge. Arguably the most difficult boss in the game and one of the biggest challenges in the entire series. The Orphan of Cause takes much patience and timing. While Phase 1 becomes generally manageable with some practice, Phase 2 is rarely mastered even by experienced players. He grows in size and if possible he becomes even more erratic than Phase 1. Even being able to summon lightning from the shoreline where the corpse of Cause, or some say Cosm, lies, the arena itself is mostly just a flat beach and shore, but the setting and atmosphere work perfect for this chaotic finale to the DLC had you already taken on Lawrence. One of the three bosses that displays Nightmare Slain upon defeat, you'll certainly need to recover your breath upon besting the orphan for the first time. I know I did. The soundtrack isn't one of Bloodborne's more memorable, but its frenetic pacing, especially in part two, accompanies the fight very well. It is posited that the spirit will linger with the corpse until the mother is slain, perhaps evidenced by the ending cutscene stating the child has returned to the ocean and killing it freedom to traverse the cosmos. Ah, sweet child of Kos, returned to the ocean, a bottomless curse, a bottomless sea, accepting of all that there is and can be. Coming in at number 4 is Grandpa Santa himself, the boss of an optional area easy to miss on a blind playthrough. He is well worth the side trip to this fan favorite location. Artistically, Martyr Logarius is pretty damn cool. As you saw in the intro, he's a skeletal figure that gradually gains his bearings into a Herculean man, rising from his throne to stand tall atop the castle's delightfully snow-kissed rooftop. As you fight amidst a dramatic war-like overture, Logarius can seem erratic, his magic unavoidable, but past that magic he is actually quite easy to parry. As noted by Alfred, Logarius was once head of the executioners and led a charge against the vile bloods of Canehurst Castle. He is now wearing the crown of illusions as he hides the secret of the undying Queen Annalise. The combination of great soundtrack, gorgeous arena, and the unique mechanics mixing Lugarius' magic and sight culminate in one of the best bosses in Bloodborne. Ho, oh, got lost for a minute there, but opinion seems to be generally divided on whether Ebrietas is a majestic celestial being or a hideous monster. Either way, her design is quite immaculate and presents what really feels like a grand boss that should be the finale of a somewhat hidden area but very relevant portion of the game. The 
purple tinge of the arena splashes beautifully behind Ebrietus's pale blue figure, especially once she begins tapping into her version of A Call Beyond. The soundtrack takes a little bit to kick in, but paces well with the overall fight. Once the fight progresses, it really makes the fight feel like a grand celestial contest. Ebrietus's charge attack may be a little OP, but she still has a pretty unique moveset once she mixes in her spells. She's a highly difficult beast in your first playthrough and even challenges more experienced players. Ebrietas is a great one who was discovered by the Healing Church which founded the choir to protect and study her as noted by Bloodborne's fandom. The overall package of arena, sound, and grand atmosphere land Ebrietas in the top five of Bloodborne monstrosities. What isn't there to say about good old Father Gascoigne? He looks cool as hell, he has a badass moveset, he's dripping with lore, his arena is super unique and well designed, and his soundtrack is totally badass. All that wraps up in one of the most memorable lines and introductions in the whole series. We have ourselves a masterpiece of a boss. Probably a boss that made many put down the game entirely, Father Gascoigne can be brutally difficult for new players. But a little management of timing and dodging, as well as parry practice, actually makes Father Gascoin very beatable. That, along with item usage of the Ute music box, oil urns, and Molotov cocktails can aid you greatly. The music box can be obtained by speaking to one of Gascoin's daughters earlier in Yarnum. In the arena itself, we find Gascoin's wife dead on top of the building. She had failed to bring the music box, and Gascoin, not recognizing her, took her life. Phase 2 of the fight sees Gascoigne no longer able to stave off his growing bloodlust and beast transformation, where he becomes much more aggressive, but has titanic parry windows, which can be used for the win. Certainly one of From Software's best bosses they've ever created. We've finally arrived at the man himself. Garmin the First Hunter dramatically rises from his wheelchair upon refusal of your submission to deliver one of the best opening boss scenes in the game. It always comes down to the hunter's helper to clean up after these sorts of messes. Tonight, Garmin joins the hunt. A beautiful rolling hill covered by a field of delicate white flowers, full glowing moon in the sky, make this one of the best arenas in a glorious final battle. Garmin presents many challenges that the game has prepared you for all along. Dodging, parrying, in and out timing, and stamina management are all necessary to best the first hunter. A hauntingly beautiful orchestral arrangement accompanies this duel as Garmin wields his giant burial blade with great dexterity. As one of the main characters in the game, an entire video could be dedicated to the lore of Garmin. It should be known that Garmin is responsible story-wise for the lack of shield play in Bloodborne. He purposely lacks armor and wears common clothing to allow for quick fluid movement, which he displays throughout the contest. Also, his burial blade spawned the idea of trick weapons. All in all, Garmin is a well-balanced boss who presents a challenge to first-time players, but is not insurmountable with a little practice. A corpse should be left well alone. Ah, Lady Maria, a fan favorite for sure. One of the most popular bosses in the entire series, and for good reason, a violent yet beautiful dance in terms of gameplay mechanics. A three-part show of dancing, blood, and fire. Part one can be simplified by dodging past Lady Maria and getting a few shots in or parrying and following up with the riposte. She turns more violent in phase two, resorting to her abandoned ways at the vile bloods in order to stop you as well as adding in two special attacks. The climax is Lady Maria going full out fire mode for a frantic yet beautiful finale. The feeling of a violent dance is always a delight to play as Lady Maria nails the gameplay mechanics. In terms of lore, Lady Maria is a distant relative to Queen Annalise and citizen of Canehurst. She originally studied under Garmin, but turned sour on hunting at some point, mentioning a corpse should be left well alone, perhaps referring to Cause or herself. The doll strikes a similar resemblance to Lady Maria as well. 
All in all, this encounter sports a beautiful dojo-like arena with the sunlight trickling through, a stunning orchestral arrangement that is paced just right, one of the most memorable cutscenes in the series to open the fight, and the actual design of Lady Maria herself make this one of the best boss fights from software has ever produced. Ludwig is undoubtedly from software at their very best. From the mid-fight cutscene introducing the Holy Moonlight Sword, to the crisp dodges and timing involved to the stunning soundtrack, this fight is boss perfection. The difficulty is quite high, but not insurmountable once you learn its patterns. Part 1 of the fight is quite rambunctious as Ludwig thrashes about on all four limbs, but as you steer clear of his charge attack and don't get too greedy, you can chip away at him. Part 2 evolves into a beautiful symphony as Ludwig's attacks almost coincide with the soundtrack itself as you dodge the attacks of the Holy Moonlight Sword, which looks absolutely stunning in Bloodborne. This all culminates in a repost for the win and a small conversation with Ludwig, in which you can choose to lie and tell him his church hunters were honorable or tell him the truth. In the end, we get this magnificent beauty of a weapon. Even in this darkest of nights, I see the moonlight. Well, that wraps up ranking some of the best design bosses in gaming. I hope you enjoyed my first attempt at this type of video. Please feel free to chat below and leave any constructive critique that you may have. This was my first attempt at a fully scripted and produced video, and while I have much to work on, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Please subscribe as this is something you would wish to continue to see as next week at the same time the Dark Souls rankings will be dropping. Thank you to Fandom and Fextra Life where much of the lore references were pulled from. Please tune in next week where we explore the bosses of Dark Souls 1. This is Ghost Repost. Have a good one. Farewell, good hunter. May you find your worth in the waking world.